Hey everyone, I'm Chris Cito, and I'm a software reliability engineer over at Cockroach Labs. I work on their database as a service platform, and today we're going to be talking about Django ORM runtime complexity. So the inspiration for this talk is a few years old at this point, actually. A company I previously worked for was having some performance issues with the REST endpoint, and upon digging into it, we realized that every single request to this endpoint resulted in a couple hundred SQL queries being made. And uh, due to some unfortunate choices that we made, uh, we found that traditional mitigation tactics weren't quite effective enough. So naturally, we dropped down to raw SQL. Technically, we had a solution. We were able to drop the number of queries made by this endpoint down to one, and we were also able to pull a couple seconds off of this endpoint's runtime because of that. However, we ended up with a query much like the one on this slide. And we quickly found that queries like this become very unmaintainable. Uh, it's pretty easy to catch typos because SQL will validate that for you. However, if you accidentally filter on the wrong field or you join on the wrong columns, things can look like they're working pretty well until you're in production. You realize that you've accidentally missed a permissions check or something similar to that. Um, so we deemed this to be largely unacceptable. On top of that, we had to create this little corner of the code base that was incompatible with the rest of it because we had to work with the results of raw SQL queries rather than Django models. So for all those reasons, we're going to be working within the constraints of Django's ORM. We want any solutions that we come up with to be maintainable and like, easily parsable by the human eye, not a robot. And on top of that, we want all of our solutions to be compatible with Django's existing ecosystem. Back to the namesake of this talk, we're gonna do a quick overview of what Big O notation is. Big O is a way to describe the relationship between a certain characteristic of a function and some number n as n approaches infinity. Now, generally speaking, the characteristic we're going to be tracking is the runtime of a function, and n is going to be a data set that is being operated on. However, this characteristic can also be the memory usage of a function as this data set grows, or even the number of network requests that a function ends up making. Looking at our graph, we'll see that O of 1, or O of any constant value for that matter, indicates no relationship between this n value we're tracking and this characteristic we're tracking. Regardless of how large n grows, our characteristic is going to remain constant. O of n indicates that there is a linear relationship between this n value and our characteristic. So if we are iterating over a list of n values, the runtime of that function is going to increase linearly with the length of this list. O of n squared, on the other hand, indicates a slightly more explosive looking uh, relationship between this n value and our characteristic. You'll often see this in functions that have doubly nested loops. And as long as we know what the upper bound of our n value is, it's, it's pretty okay to have characteristics like this. We'll say that this is the maximum value that this characteristic can become, and we're okay with that. However, if you're in a situation where the upper bounds of n is unknown, this is when this type of characters can be scary as you aren't really sure how high you'll end up growing. And finally, we have our O log n. O log n indicates that as n begins to approach infinity, our characteristic is going to approach some upper bound here. Now, this graph isn't fantastic. I drew it myself, but that's what we're going for. And you'll often see this in functions that are taking their input and dividing it in half over and over again until they find a given result. Uh, specifically, binary search has this type of runtime complexity. For the purposes of this talk, the characteristic we're going to be tracking is the number of SQL queries performed, and our n value is going to be the size of our database or the number of rows and the number of relations in it. It's important that we are not tracking the execution time of these queries just the number of queries itself. Why do we care about tracking the number of SQL queries we're making rather than the total execution time of these queries? This is because when we're making very, very fast queries, namely primary key lookups, we'll find that the amount of overhead it takes to 
build the SQL, send it over to the database, and get the results back often overshadows the amount of time it takes for the database to execute that query. And we'll see that in our example here. If we just load a sequential list of users, uh, this doesn't take very much time at all. However, if we were to load the same number of users by making in queries and loading them directly by the primary key, it's about 100 times slower. And we'll see that the time it takes to compile this SQL and just get to the database and get back takes up a significant portion of this time. So anything we can do to reduce the number of fast queries we're making will save us an enormous amount of time in our execution path. Let's pretend that we're building a blogging platform. Now, whenever a user wants to get a specific post, they'll give us the post ID, we'll look it up and send it back to them. Regardless of the number of posts being stored in our system, this operation will always perform exactly one query. This is an example of an O of 1 operation. Every post in our system is going to have some number of comments attached to it, and every comment is going to be made by an author. When we go to display these list of comments to our users, we want to also display the author that made them. So as we loop over our list of comments, we're going to be touching the author attribute. This is going to result in us loading the author from the database. And this is an example of an O of N operation. Colloquially, this is known as the N plus 1 problem, which we're going to be diving into more later. O of N squared operations can often happen by accident. In our previous example, we were iterating over a list of comments and displaying the authors. Now, if we decided to take a step back from that and iterate over first a list of posts, and then for all those posts, load the comments for those posts, and then display them along with the authors, this would be an O of N squared operation. As the number of posts grows and the number of comments on those posts grows, the number of queries we end up making grows exponentially. Finally, we have our O login operations. Now, I don't think there are any practical applications that would result in a login amount of queries being generated, so we're not going to cover this any further. So let's talk about the N plus 1 problem. Jumping back to our example earlier of an O of N query, uh, we'll see that as we iterate over our comments here, every time we touch an author, it has to be loaded. Now, this is the classic n plus 1 example, and it can be easily solved by performing a join on our authors table. Conveniently for us, Django's select related function will perform this join for us and automatically populate our author attribute. So we don't end up with any more additional queries, we just get one query for this entire function. The situation of having many related rows is a bit more complicated. If we were to perform a SQL join here, we would either get a lot of duplicated posts or only one comment per post, depending on what type of join we did. So to solve this problem, we're actually going to be looking towards Django's prefetch related functionality. Now, prefetch related will, for all the posts that we have pulled out in our query, it will find all the comments associated with them and then perform an in-memory join and populate a cache for us. So whenever we touch our comment set attribute, we won't actually be doing another query, we'll just be touching this cache. And this results in us only having to do two queries instead of O of N queries. In real world situations, you'll often find yourself spanning many relationships in order to stitch together some data that we can send back to our end users. Now, we can still reach to prefetch related to stop our code from making an explosive amount of queries. However, for every additional relationship we end up spanning, Prefetch related is going to have to make one additional query to load that relationship. And if you happen to be spanning a very high number of relationships, namely many to many fields where the through table actually matters, you may find yourself in search of alternative solutions. Conveniently, we'll be talking about an alternative solution that gives us the same functionality as prefetch related, but with a single query. Let's talk about some of my favorite and morally flexible SQL features, aggregations and lateral joins. Before we talk about SQL aggregations, we're actually going to take a look at the JSON build array function. Now, what this function allows us to do is take a set of columns and roll it up and return it as if it were a single column. Now, on its own, this function isn't particularly useful, but it forms a very important primitive for what we're going to be building up to. SQL aggregations are functions that run across a given set of rows. 
If you've ever used a count query, you've used a SQL aggregation. Generally, these are these types of functions are used to compute some type of statistic about a table, namely the average, sum, minimum, or maximum value of a given column. Now, uh, databases that support the JSON data type have this neat little aggregation called the JSON AG. And what it allows us to do is, rather than computing a statistic about a column, it actually allows us to build up a JSON representation, or just JSON object in general, over the set of the given rows. Now, when we can combine that with our JSON build array function, what we get is the ability to take a set of rows and bundle it into the place of a single column. Now, this would be particularly helpful if we had some way to, say, run aggregations for each row of a given query. This would allow us to embed entire relationships into a single row. Lateral joins give us a way to execute effectively a for each loop inside a SQL query. Now, unfortunately, it is fairly difficult to convince Django's ORM to generate anything besides a left or inner join. So for the purpose of this talk, we're actually going to be making use of what's called a correlated subquery. And a correlated subquery uh, runs on the same execution pass path as a lateral join and gives us the exact same style of for each loop, but it is located in the select portion of a query rather than in the join portion. And that just makes it a lot more easy for us to control in a generated style. When we take all of these pieces and combine them together, besides getting a very ugly query, we also get the ability to, for every row in a query, find its related rows, bundle them into a column, and return that to Django's ORM. Now, in this example here, we've taken all posts in our system and we found all comments for those posts and squished them into a list of values and included that with our results. Now, this would be extremely helpful if we had some way to take these values and turn them into fully fledged Django's models and maybe just wedge them into the prefetch cache. In this case, we would get the exact same functionality as prefetch related gives us, only we wouldn't have to make additional queries every time more relationships are spanned. Unfortunately, loading the Django prefetch cache and turning these JSON blobs into models is out of scope of this talk. We want to stay mostly centered around how to reduce the overall number of SQL queries we're making. However, if you are interested in how to do that, I've bundled all of this into a library called Django Include. More importantly, this library provides a drop-in replacement for prefetch related. You're likely asking yourself, should I use this technique? And the unfortunate answer is, it depends. Can it help in certain situations? Certainly, I've seen it take up to seconds off of certain rest endpoints. On the other hand, is it a silver bullet? No, there's plenty of situations where it may end up performing worse. It's also important that you keep in mind what database you're using. The queries that we're generating here are analytical style queries. Not all SQL databases are optimized to serve analytical style queries. And we'll also see that pop up in the benchmarks that we're about to look into. Before we jump into these, quick disclaimer, these are very simple benchmarks. There are an incredible amount of variables that could affect the performance of these queries one way or the other. To name a few, there's the connection to the database, there's the resources available to the database, the schema that you're testing against, and even the volume of the data in your schema. So with that in mind, it's important to take these with a grain of salt and make sure that you test against your own environment to determine what may be best for your situation. So for most of these benchmarks, we'll see that we're running effectively neck and neck with uh, prefetch related. We're generally within a few milliseconds, one way or the other, of itch performance. It's not until we start loading multiple top-level rows that we see prefetch-related starts to outperform this strategy. When we run these benchmarks against CockroachDB, we'll see effectively the same results. Most of the time, we're going to be within a few milliseconds, plus or minus, of prefetch-related. However, when we look at our tests of running, loading multiple top-level rows, we'll see that we're getting absolutely blown out of the water by prefetch-related. And this is because 
CockroachDB is not optimized for running analytical queries. It's optimized for running transactions. Unfortunately, we don't have a great way to ask and answer questions or handle comments, uh, but please feel free to hit me up on Twitter at underscore ostriches or on GitHub at Crescido. If you're interested in how I got these benchmarks or anything else related to this talk, I'm going to be dumping a lot of this information into a GitHub repo, PyCon 2020, big oh no. Thanks for watching.